Hello and welcome guys. We are coming back today to talk about social contracts, session zero, run design, and campaign design. Um, this is actually a second take on this one. Uh, I got into some question and answer stuff super early into it, so I'm just starting over. The other was like eight minute long. Um, session zero and social contracts is really where you should have everybody sit down and talk about who they want to play. Notice I did not say what, I said who. Who do you want to play? Unlike uh, the your standards of the fantasy stuff, which is previous video, not going to go in depth on that. Shatterrun is kind of built for any mix and match of a party that you guys are interested in playing people's lives you want to explore and that kind of thing. A A Johnson and your fixers fixers more so will know what your team's strengths are. Johnsons will not hire a team that to his knowledge cannot complete the job he needs done. Um, this makes session zero and social contracts very important to Shadowrun as opposed to other games. Um, because of the way it works and things are designed, A. Johnson is not going to hire a team to do a, a deep run on a host somewhere that doesn't have the matrix support to do it. Similarly, they are not going to hire a high magic type opposition for a team that does not have a lot of mages, or if they don't have decent social skills, to go infiltrate a high society party. That kind of stuff can be fun, but should not be the the focus of where most of your runs and campaign goes. Because forcing the square peg is not gonna... It's gonna leave some rough edges, and it's not gonna be as fun for anyone else. So sitting down and talk about, I have the idea for this young prodigy that did really well in school, but it turns out that he is actually a technomancer and is dropping out of school because of that. So all of a sudden his life is burned upside down. I am playing I want to play the undercover detective whose life got tossed by the crash and now actually has to be a criminal. That kind of thing. Um, from there you can you can sculpt your characters in a lot of ways. That undercover guy, he could be a face because he has a bunch of the social skills to infiltrate and impersonate and kind of interact with that without giving up who he actually is. Or he could be a heavy-duty street samurai that's, you know, a little bit on the... Um, a little bit more on the brute strength enforcer kind of way. And... That's where that kind of stuff comes in to you. Um, the the second part is more the the social con social session zero is more on the character and mechanic side of things. Um, the social contract comes into rules strictness. Number one rule of most RPGs should be don't be a dick. Setting your ground rules for a, a multi session game that you guys are going to play should include some discussion about that. You guys are adults. You can talk about certain things like adults. Um, when I run games, I don't like to go through and alright, you're taking a shot. Do you have your smart link on? Uh, it's actually a too much noise here, so it turns your smart link off, so you're noise negative two. It's in dark conditions, but you have low light, so that's only negative three, and he's at medium range, so take an additional negative two. That's a lot of work and math for every single roll to come down. It's like, oh, you want to roll a con dice? Okay, let me go in and, all right, he's having a bad day at work, so that's negative two for you, but he has a weakness for dwarves, so that's a plus one. All of that extra work, just decide at the beginning if you guys want to get that in depth with it. 
I don't like to get that in depth with it. I find it slows the game down when you are trying to add modifiers on every single roll. But your table may be different. Um, that is completely up to you guys. This will also preemptively help with rules lawyers and abusers. Um, granted, if this is a group of people that you know and have interacted with and are hopefully real life friends with, if not, maybe you're just internet friends with them. You know a bit about who they are and how they act and getting it out of the way ahead of time that, come on guys, we're just trying to have fun, don't be that guy, will save you a headache down the line when he tries to pull some ridiculous um, obscure rule to just grind play to a halt and make everybody's life more miserable. That's not what you guys are there to do. So it's preemptively nipping that in the bud. Just don't deal with it. If it is somebody that you know and preferably you don't have to deal with these people on the regular, just don't game with them. Um, yeah, that's great. It could be your your girlfriend's brother that she really wants to to have play because it's a family thing and maybe she doesn't see the ridiculous roles layering but sit down like an adult and be like all right i don't want it to sound like you're we're singling you out but every time you bring up this obscure role it slows play down it's not that serious man we're just trying to relax and have a good time just I don't know the people you're you're talking about, so I can't exactly get into specifics on how exactly to deal with it. But it's one of those things that you can that you should handle out of character as an adult from from word go. Um, another important thing is going to be the theme of your game. Are you going to be uh, on a more hooding type thing? Uh, see my other video for details on that. Are you going for a street gang feel? Are you Are going to work for organized crime? Are you guys independent? Are you guys uh, dock wagon people who are responding to things? Um, that is the kind of thing that you will, guys will also discuss at Talk Because this will tweak who your characters are and may also influence some of your rules strictness. Because if you are trying to play a more light-hearted, um, fun... I don't know, fun's not the right word. A more light-hearted feel for your game, then you're probably not going to want as much rule strictness. Whereas if you're going for Ocean's Eleven, Black Trench Coat, everything has to fall directly into place to work out properly, being stricter on rules will both increase the challenge of that but also make it more accomplishable because you won't have to worry about a little bit of GM fiat here and there to make things that stuff. Um, so, trying to think what else. Um, it will also allow you to uh Avoid certain awkward situations. Uh, one of the GM things that I will listen to, because I listen to a lot of podcasts, um, mentioned the the X card, where if you have, like if you're sitting around a table, just have a um, an index card in the middle of the table with a big X on it. And any time you guys get into a situation where one of the players feels uncomfortable, they can just kind of like reach out nonchalant and just kind of you know, give it a tap on it. The scene that you are in ends, no questions are asked, and you move on. And this isn't just for, you know, the tumblerinas out there where they get triggered at every now and then, but, like, the description they gave when I heard about this was um, the the one player had a severe case of arachnophobia, and they happened to be dealing with a giant spider, and as it's describing the the dripping venom from its mandibles with all of its hairy legs, the the person got so weirded out that they got out from the table and left. Well, they left the room. 
I think they maybe even left the game because they just couldn't deal with it. And as a GM and the other players around the table, you are here not to make anybody feel weirded out by that. So having like that X card in there to to give everybody the option to tap out and to discuss in your session zero type stuff. I don't like spiders. I'm sorry, guys. I I have a real thing. Now, when you get to that scene where the GM thought ahead of time, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have this giant spider. You change it from a giant spider. Now it's a giant snake. And most of you can still have, you know, the venom dripping from the fangs and the the sound as the scales skitter across the um, rocks. I can't believe I had that much trouble coming up with the word rocks. Um, and now that player, rather than not having a negative experience, continues to have this the positive experience that you guys wanted to um, wanted to have together as a table in the in this RPG. Uh, and then I think the final thing, as far as social zero type stuff, is. Um, Operative storytelling. I, as a GM, am not here to sit down and speak to you this grandiose book that I am writing. We are all sitting around the table together to craft the story that tells what happens to these four to six, however many characters, and the world around that. I can sit here and talk to you about. Star Wars, and that'd be one thing, but imagine if you would, you're playing Han Solo and Luke and Leia and Chewie and all the rest of those guys, and that becomes your campaign rather than you guys You guys are making the decision for Han Solo to, to stop being self-centered and come back to save everybody in the, the one episode, or there's the awkward scene where Luke and Leia, like, have that romantic interest, and then uh, maybe the character, maybe the players decided, oh, you know what would be weird? Is it not weird? Sorry. Um, you know what would be an interesting RP thing to figure out is that we're actually related and we didn't know. Um, everybody sitting at that table is there to craft that story. How you go about it is up to you guys and your table and how you want to define that. The the session zero slash social contracts is where you guys kind of define what you wish to to do with that. Um, in the one game I am involved with as a weekly thing, the one player has the has the hope that should something horrible happen to their character, that they get to sort of re-roll as an AI project that they were working on. Like, their character goal is, I'm working towards, you know, doing some software stuff to create a, like, an agent or another program type thing. And it would be interesting to her, should that character die, to have that, you know, maybe she was in Hot Sim, and that's the last piece. You know, she dies, her mind is released into the Matrix, sort of. And that is what, that is the event that grants sentience to the AI. Um, that kind of thing. Or, granted, there's no rules for it in 5th edition, but a late awakening slash emergence could also be an interesting thing. That This is an avenue I wish to um, explore with my character, and you bring that up right at Session Zero in Social Contracts. Um, I had a character on the hub who the character died, but the meat lived on and she had amnesia. Um, complete 180 on her personality and that kind of thing. And it led to a lot of really interesting RP opportunities because all of a sudden, she's a blank slate. And I need to rediscover who she is and how her personality will continue to evolve based upon the completely different group of people she is now exposed to. Um, it was a lot of fun. I was kind of sad to retire her, but you know, when you get to the 500 karma levels, it's really hard to not Tilt games in two ways are not supposed to go when you massively outbalance everybody else on the team. 
so I did a little looking on the r slash Shadowrun thing, and I came up with my kind of had it pointed at me a uh, a news article that we will use to do some run design. Uh, it was the Kosh brothers are accused of hiring former NYPD chief to dig up dirt on journalists. So there's a lot of ways we could build this into a shatter run. Uh, way number one, false evidence. The U runners can easily be hired to uh, plant false evidence to incriminate the brothers, the NYPD chief, or the journalist. Any one of those areas could be used to be the goal of a Shadowrun, or maybe all three. Um, it's a a number of things that you could do with a singular headline if you could find you know a pretty solid headline. Um, number two is which kind of goes into the false evidence is you could use it as a distraction tactic. Maybe um, maybe the run is actually against the police chief, and the runners are like, all right, how are we going to take him out? They, uh, they decide that they're going to get this story going to um, – draw the police chief away from his busy job, because now he's going to have to at least make a couple of public appearances at a hearing to get this cleaned up. That gives you plenty of opportunity to either, maybe if you're supposed to kill him, to take him out by your sniper fire, to maybe have him make contact with somebody else that he normally wouldn't be able to. Maybe you set up your face to be his lawyer to... You know, they can then have a private conversation for you to deliver a message to him somehow. Um, maybe the journalist just needs that last bit for a, a big story or is framing another person. Um, there's a lot of things in here that you can use to um, to build a shot on. I like the idea of the lore because that is the... Uh, is more interesting. So the goal that you come up with as a GM is to get the chief into the public. That is what the Johnson wants. He doesn't even necessarily have to tell you um, why he wants this. You may not even be the team that is there to, to shoot him or to do whatever it was. Maybe he wants the chief out of his office for an extended period of time and occupied so that they can go in and plant bugs or get to his personal uh, things. That th That is not important. That will come down to the the Johnson's motivations. I should have made this a bigger box. So the Johnson wants another team to get into the office, but not necessarily your team, because with the... The option to have all of your information in one spot. It's like, all right, I could have my one team do all of this stuff, but I know this team. I know they don't have the, maybe they don't have the matrix person that I need to get into the office to hack through his computer and do that kind of thing. Maybe they don't have the social person so that they would get made basically as they go to walk around the um, precinct. I struggle for the word again. Or maybe I'm just looking to geek the uh, geek the police chief in a public setting to send a message, which is a completely legitimate criminal thing to do. Um, maybe my the runner team has a bit of a reputation for being nice guys, and if I can not tell them that I want the guy to die. I just need him to, to make a public appearance in the next two to th All right, I'm just going to go back then to where I was going. So the Johnson wants the police chief dead to send a message. Um, doesn't want to tell the runners that because they have a 
bit of a nice guy tinge to them and don't want all of this extra blood on her hands. So you don't tell them. And then, uh, you don't tell them so you don't jeopardize the operation. Um, danger that the team is going to find the KE precinct. You are literally trying to get a man out of their house. The chief uh, workaholic trying to clean up the streets because this makes it look good for everybody when the streets are clean or stuff is uh, hitting the news in a positive fashion. Um, let's fix that. Some other things you're going to have to worry about is public interpretations. Um, getting into a man that is high up in the community is kind of kind of difficult. Um, being a police chief, he is an important person. He is very busy. He is maybe also um, actively investigating the runners. Maybe not him directly, but maybe a man on his team has some evidence from previous runs that your guys have done. So that is another thing you have to worry about. Maybe they have previous evidence that your guys don't need to worry about. It's like, oh crap, in a different run, our social guy or our street samurai was caught on camera. So if he's going to go in, he's going to need to have disguises. He may not go in at all. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, your contacts. Um, some people may have night errant based contacts that they know. Uh, beat cops, detectives, that kind of thing. Maybe one of your characters is a is the beat cop that we talked about earlier. That not the beat cop, the uh, the undercover cop. Maybe he knows this police chief. Um. Uh, that is a way that you can all of a sudden bring in your uh, your character's backstory and get them a little investment into uh, into the world and the campaign in that fashion. Um, so having this situation, maybe that uh, maybe they know somebody in the the news world that they can use to. Hey, uh, do you know anybody that is working with them to put things out into the news as I struggle for words? i got to stop doing that. Work on my public speaking. So now we have our general idea of some dangers that we're going to need to worry about in our run. Zone. We know the, the objective is to have the police chief get an extended public appearance. We didn't tell the runners this because... Um, we didn't want them to to interfere. So we can actually throw that down as a potential danger, too. Potential danger. Runners' sensibilities. Um, we have a couple of dangers that the team is going to overcome. They can't really go in and get him out directly because you are literally walking into the, the viper's nest, as it were. There'll be cops everywhere, and all that kind of stuff. The police chief himself is a workaholic, and he doesn't really come out on his own to make public appearances. It's very much from his work, maybe to even uh, straight to his house, which is nearby, because he's a he's a higher up. Uh, maybe he always has a secretary slash bodyguard that is with him, that kind of thing. Um, you are dealing with a public figure and trying to have a public thing happen, so you have to worry about being caught on news cameras and that kind of thing, increase your public awareness, that kind of aspect. And if this is not your your first kind of run, any previous evidence that KE has on you could limit your options as to what you can do. If you have left uh, bullets in walls that have magic to the gun that you're having, they get your head on the gun. They can now link you to all these other crimes. Um, facial facial recognition. Maybe you ran into some actual, like maybe you had a gunfight with some KE previously. 
that's all in there. If you have contacts that are in Night Errant, you don't want to call them up and be like, hey, uh, Francis the Chief, you know where he lives? Because then, going back to what I said about a living world, when something bad happens to the Chief, your contact is be like, hey, uh, I got some, some dangerous questions for you because you were asking me about you know, Chief Emmanuel, and now all of a sudden he's dead. And uh, you asked me about him like two days ago. Uh, this is going to get awkward, isn't it? And then all of a sudden you have a, um, a big problem with your personal comments. Like, oh crap, what was his loyalty rate? Do you think he told that he might have a lead on who, who set him up to be shot? Do you think that, you know, he's going to, was he a clean cop? Is he going to take a bribe to keep quiet? Is he going to hold it over you for things down the line? Um, that kind of thing. So given as how we have the, the news article, we know how this went around. So we have our dangers. We have our goal. We have our Johnson's motivation. Um, now, the runners may... Uh, dependent upon the team, go about this in any number of ways. Uh, due to the news article, we know they did it by a, causing a big stir with a journalist. Uh, they could have very easily, let's say, implicated another one of the uh, the police officers on his squad into being a dirty and brought that public. Maybe. Maybe they use their contacts, like they have this detective that they know, or this B-cop that they know, that they have bribed on a couple of occasions. Maybe they set up another situation where they catch him taking a bribe on camera and turn that over to the um, to a journalist or to just you know release it out there into the news. And all of a sudden, the, the police chief has to make a public appearance stating, this is what went horribly wrong. Um, we are taking steps to do cop things about it. Officer Steve has been fired and is, you know, will not receive a pension or anything like that. He is currently uh, on his way to prison. Maybe they arrange for some kind of bullshit award to be given to him. Um, go into a... Uh, Let's go with just like a... No, we don't want to go that dark. Um, like a high school type situation where you influence them either by like faking some emails or uh, planning the idea in a couple of the parents' heads that it would be really cool if they had the police chief or a couple of officers come there and talk about Knight Errant in a slightly different fashion than they used to because I know that's something that I used to have happen when I was in school. They would, you know, bring these officers in, do some stranger danger type stuff, that kind of thing. Um, it's really hard to to design everything your runners could think of because I'm sure people in the chat right now are thinking of other ways that they could get this police chief into a public venue to send a message from the assassination. Um, please throw it into the Twitch chat and I will read it all because it'll be fun to see what um, what comes up from it. Where it gets interesting is no, you can't plan for everything. The best you can do is come up with how the world will react and the things in the world that the characters are going to have to interact with. Um, the dangers that we were talking about. Um, Lusitani says, blow something up. Make a giant, unavoidable thing where a large police response is going to have to come. And that will totally get the police chief to have to make a public statement on the terroristic effects of, you know, in Bellevue when it's been bombed three times. The news will get all pissed off and he'll have to make a statement. That will get him totally out into the thing. Granted, most Johnsons would get a little upset if you went straight to blowing things up, because that's a lot of heat. Um, 
the the best you can do is have the world um, react normally. Walking into a night errant precinct is gonna be is gonna be bad times. Any criminal worth their salt, you know, you're gonna get your sin scanned. Everybody in there is gonna have a uh, a general idea of sizing up whoever walks in. It's like, all right, are they carrying a piece? I'm gonna be on edge and that kind of thing. Um, improvisational skills will help in a situation to um, to kind of carry it through to the end. Use a lot of what your players are giving you. Um, it'll make them feel better when their ideas come true. It's like, oh, what if he has a... Let's look in the, the Matrix. Maybe he has a sick daughter or something that is in the hospital that uh, we could find out when he goes to visit her and we could get him there. Or, you know, stall that out so Mr. Johnson has the opportunity to to do whatever it is he wants to do there. Um, ha- put that stuff in. Be like, yeah, sure. You know, you guys hack into his personal fire files and that kind of stuff. Uh, you do find out that his daughter has, I don't know, six world cancer or something. Um, that'll that's a way to draw him out. Rely on your players because your players outnumber you. They will come up with more ideas because there's more of them and they are able to play off of each other in the planning stage. That can help finish out a lot of your run. The improvisational skill is like a muscle. You need to to flex it and work it in order to get better at it. Um, What I have here is basically what I will have made up in my head as to the details of a run that I am running, and I really won't go much more in-depth than this. Um, it gets kind of difficult to to plan all of the all of the stuff out. Um, however, this does have a great segue into the campaign design. And what you're going to do is you're going to probably have a easy intro run because chances are, if you're listening to these videos for some crazy reason, uh, your you or your group are new to Shadowrun and you want to kind of uh, kind of ease into it. And campaign and shadow runs are, are slightly different. Um, setting up an easy slash intro run will let everybody get kind of a feel for how the world acts and that kind of thing. Um, another important thing to do is nobody remembers the pilot. After your easy intro run, maybe do a second run that is a more... Because that is literally kicking the tires of, hey, I need to check and see um, how my dice pulls work out, how everybody else's work out. Food Fight is a great example of this. Maybe you introduce a character that will come up later. The details of that don't really matter and can really kind of be anything. Um, Nobody remembers the pilot is... You guys have had a chance to kick the tires on your character. Afterwards, maybe not necessarily in an actual session, but this is the digital age, so you guys have Skype, you guys have emails, you guys have the internet literally at your fingertips. 20 out of 24 hours, most likely. Um, You can constantly be in connections with each other. So talk about it. Um, If you're like, ah, crap, you know, I forgot on my Street Samurai to get an initiative booster, and the Adept has a bunch of initiative, and all of that other stuff. Um, You may want to tweak and rebuild your character, and let them, as long as they stay within the same general idea, like not going from a Street Samurai to a Decker, um, let them do it. Because otherwise, all you're going to do is put a negative taste in their mouth as to that character. Um, Somewhere in there, you want to put a a real run like the the easy intro run is just 
let's get some of the mechanics out of the way. It'll probably just be a quick combat, maybe a little bit of hacking, that kind of stuff, so that when you get to actual runs down the line, you are a little bit more familiar with. The real run will be kind of your um, going into a building where you're going to have to have everybody work together as a team. Your social guy might be doing social things. Your protector guy will be doing matrix things. Your magic guy will be doing magic things. Your street samurai will be doing whatever it is that your street samurai is also capable of doing that isn't put bullet into man. Um, where this real run comes it will depend upon your table's experience with Shadowrun, your table's RPG experience, and how crazy you guys want to get. Um, it can come after the nobody remembers the pilot or it can come before that dependent upon how you guys want to do it and that kind of thing if you aren't feeling i don't want to say comfortable but reasonably comfortable with the system and how things work out after your easy intro run do another one do like a medium intro run, where the consequences from those runs aren't actually going to carry forward into the campaign you know you guys can be caught on camera driving around town like a crazy man, but you're not going to get public awareness or notoriety for it because everybody as a table is learning the system. Um, do a real run somewhere, maybe after that, and then your first campaign run. For the sake of our discussion here, this first campaign run could be the run where we were talking about the police chief. Get him out there. He's into the public. That run is successful. The police chief dies. All right. What does this mean for our world? Well, now we have a a vacuum of power in a very important spot, and maybe it turns out that the person who we um, who arranged for the hit to actually go down is um, has somebody else that he has primed behind the the back channels to take over that spot. Um, standard organized crime type thing. Now we have the police chief in our pocket where the other guy was, you know, a workaholic trying to clean up the streets. Um, get your runners paid. Sure. Uh, a off campaign. So, then we'll break into two off campaign runs in our idea. Uh, these are These are more your standard one-shotty type things. But an important uh, aspect of it is to I can't get that to I just shouldn't have messed with it. Um, to introduce things that continue on your campaign storyline. Runners in Shadowrun do have a little bit of a hard time that uh, latching onto the the epic hero quest. In fantasy world, they'll be like, yo, let's go save the heroes of old so that they can complete the quest or whatever kind of Tolkien junk you want to deal with. Um, so while they're doing these other runs, you can throw out things, like little side things, like, oh, on the news this morning, you hear about how NPC1 and NPC2 are both campaigning to get the police chief's job and that kind of thing. Maybe even one of these off-campaign jobs could have interactions with that um, that kind of thing but an important remembrance is be adaptable if in that first campaign run your runners are going to latch on to some aspect of it and you know they find out oh shit the, the police chief got killed because of what we did if they want to um work on finding out who the Johnson was that hired them because they don't like being used as a patsy. That can easily be one of the off-campaign runs. Um, some form of downtime is always appreciated, so maybe he is out, like that character is out pursuing leads or working in contacts. Do a little RP with them. Maybe if it's just that character that is interested in finding that out, sit down with at a time where it's just the two of you and do a little quick one or two hour solo run session where maybe he gets a new contact. Maybe it's a crazy conspiracy nut who thinks everything is the work of dragons. Maybe. 
it actually has a little bit of nugget of truth. Maybe it's an old homeless guy who looks well fed and muscled for a homeless guy, you know, but still has got a bit of crazy to him. Who knows? Make it interesting, but don't give it away too much. Um, your off campaign runs could be whatever it is you want to do. Maybe one of your contacts calls up, it's like, hey, I need a favor, or something like that. Um, a second campaign run. This can be... will be dependent upon how your team takes what has gone on so far. Are they upset that they were used as a tool to assassinate the police chief? Maybe... Maybe the second campaign run is from the same Johnson for something else, which would be then be interesting because it's like, okay, is he just using us as a tool again or not? Maybe you're actually got getting contacted by a knight errant detective to do a job for them because they know that you were just uh, that you were involved in the police chief's death, but now they also know that you were used in a normal fashion. You weren't the trigger man, and he wants the trigger man. Um, so what he's going to do is he's going to make you um, go out and do this thing, follow up on this lead he has while keeping himself clear. And in that situation, maybe he becomes a contact. It's a low New Yin paying job because he got together a with a couple of the other police officers that he trusts, put together a small pot to pay you guys, but in exchange, he's not going to throw the book at you. Makes an interesting situation, because now, do you guys leave Seattle? Do you guys try to kill the man that knows who you are? Do you guys give him false information to save yourselves? And that kind of thing. That'll, once again, that'll depend upon your table. Um, or you give him the job from the Johnson, and you save that detective contacting them idea for a later campaign run. Um, if it's the same Johnson, do you give them a similar type job? You know, maybe this time instead of the police chief, maybe he wants some local politician dead. And you guys were able to to engineer a situation where he was able to do that. Does the team um, where it's falling apart there. I'll get a drink, maybe that'll help. Um, does the team take and complete the job? Because they uh, they want the money and they don't really care about the whole thing. But now you have introduced the Johnson again. Maybe, let's say the first meeting was through a matrix call. Now we have an in-person meeting, so things have changed. You have had the opportunity to interact with them again. Um, maybe they are upfront about the fact that, like, look, I know you're just setting this up so that you can kill another guy. Why don't you pay us more and we'll just do it for you? You tell us how you want it done and that kind of thing rather than setting up for this other guy to take the kill shot. Um, and the the off run, the off campaign runs are important because. Runners need resources. Um, they'll need money to buy specialized equipment for jobs, to pay rent, to resupply, to get better gear. They'll need karma to learn different skills, to increase their skills. They will need the opportunity to acquire different contacts, because the more contacts you have, the more interesting things you can do. Um, they are not contacts are not just gear vending machines that you call up, hey, I need a new gun. They are people who are, again, living in the world. So maybe you could work that into a run as well. You've been trying for a couple of weeks to get this new hard-to-find gun through your, your black arms dealer, and he just hasn't had any luck. But you call him up, uh, you know, after a couple of weeks of trying to get it, it's like, hey, um, I've got a guy that is selling the gun that you wanted. Now, he doesn't want... He's not selling it. He is trading it for a job. Now, all of a sudden, 
you have a an opportunity to get that specific piece of gear while at the same time giving them a run to do and maybe increasing that contact's loyalty. Maybe that contact will then become a contact for the entire team. Um, that kind of thing. Normally, I would not endorse the thing of, hey, uh, I want to get this crazy car. I want to do a run to go steal one. Because that is like, all right, well, now you're not a shadow runner that is a professional criminal. Now you're a car thief who is a dime a dozen. Like, if you guys want to do the campaign of being petty thieves and stealing stuff for chop shops and such, sure, we can do that. But that comes back to the Session Zero social contract stuff where you discuss the theme of your game. However, every once in a while, dice are fickle and, well, intolerant overlords. They do not care how much you really want to get a an item. They're just not going to come up. This will give you an option to uh, to make things more available to them at the same time as not paying them. Well, not necessarily not paying, but maybe you pay them a little bit of money for the people who aren't getting the gun or something. That time I heard my headset. Um, but you don't want to, like, give them assault cannons left and right. That's uh, that's not a good idea. But if you did solar runs for your, you know, you did one for your guy that uh, wanted to investigate what happens, like the conspiracy behind your run. Okay, he's had a solo run. Maybe your mage did an initiation and he had a little solo RP time. Um, your decker had some RP between his dependent on whoever that may be and did some things there. But your street samurai really didn't do anything, but has been really looking for this gun for a while. Throw him a bone. You know, anything to encourage more RP is good. Um, so after you have your second campaign run, you have now either introduced a new player in the situation or reestablished an old one. Um, I'm just going to put a one to two, one to three off campaign runs. You can do a like another one to three one shot type things. Again, seed throughout it a um, a feel of the world continuing with the story of the campaign. Um, maybe have maybe the players get pulled over, but it happens to be that detective that um, they worked for in the second campaign mission, where he recognizes them and lets them off, or maybe he pulls them over to deliver a message of some kind while they're going about because he would have all of their information as a police officer. Um, but maybe while they're on one of these side runs, have the the bad guy Johnson call them up and offer them a sub objective in one like their run is to break into a building and sabotage a prototype. Maybe the the campaign bad guy Johnson, air quotes, calls finds out about it, calls them up halfway through their planning type phase and it's like, Hey, I heard you guys were after prototype X. Uh if instead of like, you know, sabotage your data and stuff, but if you could bring me the drone itself or the prototype itself, I would offer you such such a such a new game. Um, so now you have reinserted that entity, however it is you want to work it out, um, and put a little twist on the job that they were doing, which maybe now that you're on like your sixth or seventh run has got pseudo routine do a couple of these maybe more of your your contact oriented runs really depends upon your cable and stuff and what your players are latching on to if they have if you have one guy who is really into doing stuff with his contacts or maybe his dependent or something like that run with it use that that is how you're going to be getting your players involved um and an important thing to also note at this point is if your players seem more interested in 
some other aspect. Maybe that dude's dependent or maybe some other contact or something along those lines. Don't necessarily stop your campaign, but steer it in that direction. Because if you keep trying to pull them back onto your police chief assassination plot that you have going on, it's going to kind of detract from things. Um, you can continue to seed that information from that plot that you had, because maybe instead of hiring um, your PC team of runners, he's hiring other runners to to do jobs. Um, from here, we're going to go into a third campaign. A third campaign run. This can be kind of anything again. Uh, we had the decision earlier of Repeat Johnson or the police detective. Maybe this is the the flip of that. However, you want to um, work it out, and something happens there. Maybe he wants another important political person assassinated. Maybe he is. Uh, Maybe the Johnson's on the defensive now. You, you know, your police guy. Actually, the having the third one be a the police detective guy contacting the team and doing the job will lead better into a, say, a fourth. A fourth campaign job. You know, first first job police chief assassination. Second job can be some political person assassination. Third job is the detective contacting the team. Like, hey, I know you were involved. I don't want you. I want the guy pulling the strings. Go find me some evidence and that kind of stuff. The fourth campaign run can easily be that Johnson calling them back up, dependent upon how they did on the investigation run. Now he knows that they gave the information to the cops, maybe now that he wants to have them set up another job, but in reality, what's going to happen is they're going to get all the way to the end, and then the Johnson's going to throw them under the bus. I'm going to frame them to get the heat off of them. Now, all of a sudden, there is a bit of a personal stake in the matter. You want to be really careful about forcibly capturing the the players, because you don't want to do it in a way that removes player agency from them, um, and give them the option to run. But since you have introduced the uh, the detective as knowing them, or at least how to get a contact with them, if they run from the police, you have the way to have them contact them later. Be like, I know you were there. We need to talk. Or if they are captured, you know, they show up in a room. They are stripped of their their gear and are handcuffed. And that detective walks in. Now you've got something. He's trying to build a better case, but his some of his leads have dried up. Uh, he's going to get you guys released. You may lose some forbidden gear or something along those lines, because that'll depend upon how the thing went. Um, you don't necessarily want to completely disempower them by taking all of their guns and ammo and that stuff, unless that was part of what you guys talked about back at the beginning. Uh, social contracts and such. Zero. Um, do another off-campaign run because chances are in the campaign little that we have set up here that we're kind of talking about, they just got hit and I've lost stuff. Um, they're going to need something to get back on their feet. Maybe it is time for another contact that um, owes them a favor to come through with hey, you know, eh, I got your back. That kind of thing. Um, somewhere between the third campaign mission and the fourth campaign mission, um, you should have a decent feel from where your players want to go. If you don't, when you guys are going out to dinner, talk about it out of character. It's like, all right, guys, this is, you know, how things have been going. Which avenues of this are you, are your characters interested in exploring? And you as players interested in exploring, because that's, that's important. You don't want to be doing stuff just to kind of get around and do that kind of stuff. Um, 
it's kind of a good way for you to get a feeling on how things are going. Um, from here, it, it will really depend upon how that talk goes or how your your feeling of things go. You can either begin to go like fifth campaign. As I forget how to spell campaign after writing it a couple of times. Um, sixth campaign. I do, you know, two campaign missions back to back, maybe for the same Johnson to follow up on it. Maybe in the fifth you find out that the guy is a Drake in service of some other dragon and you do some things and you find out his actual house. In the sixth campaign session you do an assault on that house funded by Knight Errant so you know that while you will still have to deal with the guy's private security forces and that kind of stuff, Knight Errant will be curiously slow to receive calls that night because you have set up a thing. But, you know, at the end of it, you uh, he can't hide the information on the back end of it from people responding forever. So instead of like a 10-minute HCR response, you might have a 30-minute window. This gives you a lot more time to get things done. Um, you can easily slide in some extra off-campaign missions in there. Um, it'll really depend upon the state of the team and what they are interested in doing. Um, communication is really important, and making sure that they have the ideas um, is a way that you're going to keep your players engaged. I know that was one thing that two of you guys have asked about was how do I get my players to care? Well, one of you guys mentioned you're playing a dock wagon campaign. Well, who does your who does your dock wagon guys know? Maybe they get a call for one of their contacts is now currently bleeding out because uh, it was a robbery gone wrong or something. What actually happened doesn't really matter. Then what matters is somebody that is related to them, be it actually familiar through family or through social aspects, is now in a bit of danger. And maybe the police in that game are slightly more corrupt. So whoever did the hit and tried to kill him that your dog biking guys responded to is paying off the cops. And here's your you can only give them the hooks. It is up for them to bite on the hooks and then to reel in on it. Um, Dungeon World actually does a really good thing where they talk about um, fronts and that kind of thing. To to get to the, the question we asked of... Um, this is sort of off-topic with the this session, but they were talking about getting their players to do stuff. Um, if you guys got, if you're like a loose group and you're not super committed, I don't want to say super committed, that's the wrong thing. Um, try out Dungeon World. It is, the DM never rolls dice. And you never, um, you don't say, I attack him. That's, that's not how Dungeon World goes. How do you attack him? Because that is super different on the implications on how the dice rolls work out. Um, in a in a D and D situation, you know, there's a goblin and you're a fighter. Goblin has a flail and uh, you move your your five foot step up to him and you roll your attack dice. Well, in Dungeon World, that goblin is swinging his flail wildly over his head as you approach. So they will the DM will likely ask you for a defy danger roll to get into the goblin's swinging space because otherwise, you know that wildly swinging flail crazily over his head could hit you as you get close to him. Um, unless, of course, you know, you're describing your uh, aggressive actions like, alright, I approach, I'm going to hold my shield at an angle so that when his flail comes around, it glances up and over my head, and then I'm going to come at him low so I'm, you know, staying below it. It's like, great. Roll your uh, to fight danger plus your constitution because you are using your shield to endure the hit rather than trying to dodge out of its way where if you're doing it via rolling via tuck and rolling in and underneath and then stabbing him in the stomach with your 
dagger, you are doing a defy danger with your agility, followed by your hack and slash roll. Um, one of these days I will do a game for GMs based in Dungeon World, because it is all about that narrative aspect. Um, for now, I feel like I'm done on the run slash campaign design. I'm going to throw it open to uh, the Twitch chat for questions, answers. Let me know whether or not I actually answered any of your questions before. I would greatly appreciate that as I take some drinks and check my Reddit threads. Oh, there was another thing. Um, I will actually link this to the Twitch chat so you guys can watch it at your leisure. One of the podcasts I listen to is the One Shot Podcast. It's great. You guys should totally check it out. I will put a link to that in the video description that's on YouTube and force it upon you guys in the Twitch chat. The The main GM for that is a guy named James D'Amato. He does a GM-oriented podcast called Critical Success. One of the things that he talks about in that is giving players the right amount of information. His description is like, if you are going to yeah, it'll be questions now as soon as I finish pimping these guys. Okay. Um. So the comments that he gives in giving the right players the right amount of information is when players are going through a dungeon and they walk into a room. If you just describe it as a room, it is the off chance that those players may roll a find secret doors check, find your secret door that you place there for them to continue on the adventure. However, as dice are fickle things, they will obviously fail that roll, because that is how dice always work out. However, if they go into that room, and there is an ancient elven riddle uh, relating to the fact that there is a secret passage in the room, then they're definitely going to roll a find secret doors check, whatever that may be, and then find the thing. And then they'll find the secret door, and they'll be able to continue, because that is how things are. Um, if they just walk into their room and it's you know it's just an empty room with tables, a chair, and a chest, they're not going to look for that secret door because you have hidden the lever that they are looking to pull. They want to come in there and they want to do a thing. So when they go in there and they find out there's nothing, all right, look around, there's nothing here. Back out to the dungeon down in the next hallway. Where if they go in there and they see that ancient elven riddle, they're like, there is a lever here. I'm going to take steps to find that lever so that I can pull that lever and then continue on with the new and interesting things that lever has provided. So you're going to want to make sure that you're giving, showing the players the levers they can pull, which may have been a problem that I think it was, I don't remember who it was. Somebody in Twitch chat was talking about how they were having problems. Uh, enticing action out of their players. It's potential that maybe they're just not seeing the, the levers that you're putting before them. I, Without more information, I can't really get into detail on that. However, check out that podcast. It's awesome. Uh, there's another thing in there about strong and reasonable villains that I highly recommend. I also highly recommend their actual plays because they do a whole bunch of different um, whole bunch of different systems and you can totally learn a lot from a lot of different systems just by listening to how their mechanics go and they'll give you ideas uh i am basically into the questions and answer phase so if you guys have questions please give them to me and i will provide things that resemble answers um or just commentary so far on the ideas that i have presented to you in this section all right. I've read some supposedly professional campaigns, adventure systems, and a lot of them have these places where there is nothing to give anyone a clue about a trap puzzle, etc. That is a case of bad writing, Crab. Um, professional campaigns and adventures that don't have clues are literally um, what should we call it? Uh, it is bad writing to to expect characters to do things without having giving them cause to do. Um, you don't have to run professionally written campaigns and adventures in a uh, in the way that they are written. You can totally add in your own little notes and stuff in there to make uh, 
that kind of stuff in there. Remember that these are written by people who are going to present them to other people that are going to be um, playtesting them for people who are, for the lack of a better term, professional role players. Like these people are going to be the ones that playtest the things for uh, conventions and that kind of stuff. So little, like, they come into a room, it may not have that elven riddle on the wall, but they're going to roll to search for traps and secret doors and that kind of stuff anyway, because that is what they've been doing for years. They know that this is what they should be doing, whereas newer groups and stuff aren't going to have that uh, Pavlovian response to this is what I should do. Um, there's a general rule of threes that you should give them three clues to a thing, especially if it is plot important um, to do. Puzzles, it gets really weird on because I am not a Logic 9 human, where that is very plausible to create as a Shadowrun character. Character is way more intelligent than I am and would have way less time struggling with this puzzle, assuming it's a Logic-based puzzle. So I don't like to use those unless it is a something that I know that my players, not their characters, my players are familiar with. Um, that gets kind of rough. Knowing the setting is only as important as you guys decide it is in your Session Zero stuff. Um, there are plenty of things out there. The Neo Anarchist podcast is great, which I now will pull up a podcast. Um, uh, is a great podcast for getting just basic lore and that kind of stuff. The Arcology podcast is also fantastic for everything Shadowrun. Those guys are great, and I love them for everything they do. Uh, if they actually do get to see this, hi, Mr. Vox. Mr. Johnson and Vox, sorry. I screwed that up. Um, But yeah, uh, give it like the the Star Trek type thing. Uh, Star Trek to Next Generation at the very least. Uh, probably the other ones, but I am not nearly as familiar with that as I am Next Generation. Um, they will have a person make a ridiculously in-depth analysis of a situation, and then somebody will say, oh, so it's like texting with your brain. To use your example of what's a direct, what's a DNI. Um, Shadowrun can be a lot of crazy things to try and wrap your head around. Uh, the way that the Matrix works is fairly obscure compared to how our computers work today. The fact that you literally see it everywhere. Uh, many people may not fully understand how Google Glass works. I know I don't. Um, and that's basically what AR is, only way more accessible and widespread. Um, the astral and the things involved there, like people don't necessarily get the idea that, oh, I cast an invisibility spell on him so I they can't see him. But on the astral, that actually just makes him easier to see. Can be kind of hard for newer people to wrap their minds around. Um, and some people have terrible memories or are s slow learners that don't really get it until they get that analogy of what is a DNI? It, it is brain text messaging. Oh... And then when you explain it that way, it gets kind of locked in their head. Um, the the comment of then you can be evil, give them a puzzle, have it do nothing, or alert the enemies. I that would be something that is covered in your social contracts because a for a puzzle to exist and to do it's designed to be to do nothing is begs the question of why does it exist in the first place? Is it there specifically to waste people's time? If yes, why is wasting time fun? Because that's what we're here for. We're here to, to have fun. Um, to have it alert the enemies, uh, it depends upon the situation. I, one could look at the Matrix itself as being a puzzle, and then when you get to that point where you finally have to throw that attack action, um, 
that's where things get rough. And it's kind of a puzzle, but it is going to work at the end. You, you got to be really careful about that kind of stuff. I know it was mostly meant as a joke, but I am being thorough. Um, you guys have other comments? I've never actually run a campaign for the 50-some-odd games of Shadowrun I, I run. I've never actually run a, a full-on campaign. I have had linked jobs and stuff that I guess you could call mini-campaigns, but in fantasy and that kind of stuff, the campaign is the goal that you are always working to. In Shadowrun, that's not the case. You have to take sections out to fit these off-campaign runs so that you can complete the campaign and that the world can continue to grow around your runners. Um, do you guys have any other comments, questions, that kind of stuff that you want to talk about? Oh, man. AI and weird Matrix stuff. All right. <laughs> um, AI as player characters I would be very hesitant to allow my my players to do unless um, unless this is with an experienced team because AI are not as good other matrix support options mechanically from what from everything I've read and they have a giant pile of special rules. Shatterrun is already complex enough. Throw another specific... This... Literally, this race only set of rules on top of that. And I would just... Like... Unless you're really going to sell me on something here... Um... No thank you. And... That is, again, Session Zero social contract stuff. Uh, as far as for NPCs, sure, why not? Um, as a GM, I don't have to play by the rules. Um, I can do weird things. You don't want to go completely off book, left field, screw your players over type stuff with them. But at the same time, um, having a extraction target or Having a data steal be a uh, be an AI hiring runners from the inside to extract himself can be kind of interesting. Um, other weird major stuff like technomancers and sprites eh, that's it's up to you. I would stay away from unless this is something you got into at the beginning. Deep runs because there's a whole lot of either hand wavium that needs to apply to make all characters relevant and useful there or it's just not worth it's like oh great my logic to street samurai can come into this deep run that's going to be real great considering how his build orientation went so i i would stay away from that kind of stuff um how good are the sr pregens like the ones in the book to my knowledge they are garbage uh i guess that's part of what the pre-gen type things uh, that I'm working on, community gen, I should say, uh, would be great to replace. Um, that kind of thing. Pay data is an interesting thing. Um, you can put pay data in as a way to artificially inflate the, the payout out of a run. Oh, you meant the runs. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. I lost it. Oh, pay data. Um, that Johnson may only have a certain amount of money that he is available to pay out the runners. Pay data is a good way to either just give it a blank numerical value to increase the money they get uh, at the expense of time in the Matrix doing things. Um, or it can be a good way to seed the campaign with other interesting information. It's like, yeah, you're in the example we had. Headset popped out, great. Um, so pay data can be a great way to seed information for the the campaign on a whole as opposed to just getting um, more new yen. It can be a good way for look, I need you guys to do this job. I can't pay you a whole lot, but while you're in there, you can totally snag more money out of them. If you, ha if you guys do it quietly, you can be in there for a while and get a bunch of pay data out of them, which 
then gives the players incentive to not go in and shoot the place up, and allows you to reward them for, air quotes, doing good. Um, the SR pre-gen missions, I have not played a lot of them. There have been a few that I played. One was, I think it was five minutes to midnight. It is literally five combats. Uh, not even necessarily five combats, but I believe it's like five ambushes specifically that your characters walk into. And there's no... From the little bit of talking that I have done to it, um, it is one of those situations where no matter which order your characters go into uh, the five different places they asked you to inspect, the last one is going to be the one that has the relevant information to send you on to the next aspect of the uh, of the mission. That's not good writing. Um, I know that down the line I may get a freelancer or two or somebody to see this may come up with a thing. But those missions, the, the SR missions, um, and the stuff we run at conventions are made to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Um, nine times out of ten they will always involve some form of combat because that is what most people expect when they come from an other um, other RPG settings is a large focus on combat because there's a large amount of rules in the system for combat result in combat in different ways. When in reality many Many Shadowruns can be resolved without firing a single bullet. The single best example I have had of this, um, the team that I was on was hired to shut down a building for a week or two. Didn't matter to us why, because that was not our job. We assumed that it was so that the Johnson could have his people come in while the building was shut down and plant bugs, do whatever it was to do. That was another team's job that wasn't our job. So rather than deal with all of the security that the MCT building had in, had going on, we did a couple of things. One, we found out a uh, construction company, in this case the Guadalajara and Handymen, and we convinced them to put in a bid for a city repair job. We had Katie Kaboom, the, the wonderful, crazy demolitions expert, she got a chemical that, when added to water, would make it sound like a make it smell like a sewage leak. We then went down into the uh, the sewer system under the building, put the chemical in there, let that go through for a little while, and then used a small set of explosives to open the water main. We had arranged that the Guadalajara handymen, who are intentionally incompetent, would get the bid to fix that water main situation. Uh, the building had to be evacuated and shut down because there was a horrible chemical odor that was going on, so they couldn't be there to work. And it was going to take two to three weeks to get that fixed because the handymen we had set up to get the job are uh, intentionally incompetent. They stretch things out because they are, you know, union or whatever it is. Um, the closest we got to the building was a single drive-by with a visual look at it to just get an idea at it. And you can't really write a missions mission in that kind of fashion, I don't think. Because you, if you get six dudes that show up at the table and they're all mono whip wielding mystic adepts, uh, well, chances are their plan is to go in and mono whip everybody and kill them all, so this way the building has to shut down. Uh, to answer the thing, I think it is a headset slash computer setting where my headset will automatically power off after a couple seconds of inactivity. Um, given as I have nothing audible coming through my headset right now, I don't want to put music on the background of these things, because I'm worried about when I put them up on YouTube, get uh, uh, strikes against them, to have to pull them down. It's just a pain that I don't feel like dealing with, so it's really only picking up me speaking. That might be why it is uh, automatically powering off every once in a while. Is oh, you're not using your headset, so in order to save battery, I'm going to shut off. I will be looking into 
getting that straightened out throughout the course of the year. Um, do you guys have other campaign run oriented questions? Or shall I go see what my girlfriend is up to? Um, Uh, I actually have a question for that, an answer for that question real quick. Um, so the speed of an unladen swallow is 9.8 meters per second, providing you tie its wings together and drop As If there is nothing else, I will take another 10-ish minutes. Um, I might be back. I might not. But in, within 10 minutes, I will come back um, and talk to you guys. So I'll just leave the stream running. I will uh, go see what she's up to. And we'll see what happens. So, there was PvP, and that is totally irrelevant. And it's going to be great when I twist and post an arm into pushing these two videos together for one. Um, PvP is something that you should talk about, Session Zero type stuff, because it's... It is not a... a situation that should be entered into lightly. It should be something that you talk about as a team, as adults, and to the various things. Because there was a big thread on the Shadowrun subreddit a while ago, and uh, it was, what can my decker do against the street samurai? And the answer was, call the police. Because you're not gonna, you're not gonna win a fight. There is literally no way for you to win that fight. You brick his gun, he will then beat you to death with it. It's really what it comes down to. Um, or if he know, or if he's instigating, he would have had his wireless turned off, so you can't even brick his gun. Breaking his eyes does nothing. You're not going to stand up to him in a fight because he's a street samurai. Um, so PvP should be talked about out of character, and it should be very much uh, a mutual type situation which Shadowrun is a very asymmetrical game when it comes to that kind of thing. You guys have done criminal activities together, and one guy can very easily take all the recordings from his cyber eyes, compile them into a file, and ship them off to Night Errant, along with your comm links uh, that he has marks on in your home address. Um, so you gotta, you got to be really careful about it, because it will ruin games. I know that doesn't really answer your questions, but if you guys had PvP-related questions, that it's going to be one of those situations. Um, he who strikes first strikes best. Because when I complex full auto you while cleaning my gun, uh, you're probably surprised, and then you're dead. And then it becomes the, the social contract of, dude, why'd you shoot me? That's messed up. Um, so yeah, did you guys have anything else on PvP? When is it okay? Okay is a very interesting term. If somebody... Uh, um, is obviously doing something against... Uh, against the team as a whole, then it is pretty much required for you to... Uh, like if one dude begins to do things that are bringing that would affect everybody on the team, he is dragging himself out of the uh, the team dynamic and is basically asking for it. So I should probably just shoot him then, um, because this comes back to the theme discussion the other video where it was like. Self-preservation is really what Shadowrunners are about, and that one guy that is working against you is kind of 
kind of asking for it because you guys are trying to survive and he is directly affecting your survival rating. Um, I was involved in a situation like this on the hub where one of the characters had been arrested and it was made public knowledge and was back on a run three days later. Well, what happens in that situation is very much um, you got arrested and they offered you a deal of work for us or you're going to prison. So my character shot that character with gel rounds, knocked her out, and then began to go through her comm link, found out that she was at the very least reporting our position to whoever it is that she was working for. So I shot her in the spine and we left because now the, I don't know who you're telling the the job that we're on. You have just straight up jeopardized the job. Um, Hopefully you guys would have talked about this kind of stuff out of character as a table because once you go down the route of team betrayal, it becomes really hard to not fall back into that situation. It's like, oh, for the one time Steve totally betrayed us, uh, I'm not going to trust any of his characters from now on in any game. So it's a dangerous situation that you should probably talk about it out of character and don't be afraid to retcon things should uh should it happen um and totally buy the other like if it is a straight up you guys are both on board with it and everybody's cool out of character about the situation by all means continue one of the podcasts i listened to called dungeons randomness as i get another link from my notes uh there was a couple of times where characters in it had come to um, come to inter-party blows over certain situations. And out of character, both of the players were okay with it, and that kind of stuff. The difference is, is in D&D, and most other fantasy games, everybody is a very capable combatant. Where in Shadowrun, that's not always the case. Your decker is not going to be usually throwing 20 some odd dice to shoot his assault rifle that he probably doesn't know how to use really well in addition to you know 15 dodge dice and 30 some odd soap dice like he he's not going to be a street samurai it's not it's just not the way that the system is built so the the pvp in that situation is super lopsided um do you guys have other pvp questions Otherwise, I will go do that thing, and uh, I will probably be back in 20, maybe a little later. I don't know. Are you good? Alright guys, so I'm going to hit this.